Is it possible to treat IBD drug-free and turn to food to heal naturally? Well, today we are going to find out. Welcome to the Exam Room Live brought to you by the Physicians Committee. Hello. I am the weight loss champion, Chuck Carroll. We appreciate you joining us and raising your health IQ in more than 150 countries around the world and making this one of the most consumed nutrition podcasts anywhere on the planet today. So here's the did you know. Did you know that 3 million adults, according to some estimates, in the United States alone are believed to be suffering from IBD? It is a chronic condition that can cause severe inflammation of the digestive tract, and the symptoms are not pretty. We're talking about diarrhea and bleeding and pain like you would not believe. It is messy and it is embarrassing. And many patients are prescribed long-term medication to treat the condition, but a good chunk of them, according to polls, say that the side effects from that course of treatment are oftentimes as bad as the condition itself. So the question today is, is there another way to treat IBD, a natural way where the only change is a dietary intervention? Well, my guest today says, yes, she is an integrative gastroenterologist and author and a microbiome expert. She's also the founder of Gut Bliss. Dr. Robin Chutkin is back with us today. And Dr. Chutkin, we have a full show here. It's okay. Hi, Dr. Chutkin. Uh, we have the best diets for IBD, the worst foods, whether dietary changes alone can improve IBD symptoms, what are the main causes of IBD, and of course, living IBD drug free. So a lot to get into today. Mm -hmm. And Dr. Chuckin, if any of the exam roomies who are watching live right now on YouTube and Facebook have a question for you, they can drop it in the comments or in the chat. We're going to get to as many as we can when we open up the doctor's mailbag. So Dr. Chuckin, how are you doing today? So good to see you. I'm doing great, Chuck. It's always so good to be on with you. Thanks so much for having me back. I'm thrilled that you're here. You are always such a wealth of information and such a friendly face, a warm, happy face. I mean, look at you already smiling here. We haven't even gotten into it. my green yet. smoothie. I know. I That alone makes me happy, right? I mean, your green smoothie trumps my cup of coffee. Um, so I, I will go make up for that afterward. But here's my question to you. We've got about 3 million people right now in the U.S. who are living with IBD. How many of those cases in your estimation could be corrected if somebody were to do a dietary intervention alone and, and get out of the standard American diet and start eating a little bit healthier? Chuck, in my practice, the Digestive Center for Wellness, we see about a 79% remission rate using primarily nutritional therapy, sometimes along with some of the less toxic drugs, what we call the five ASAs, the five aminosalicylic acid drugs, mesalamine preparation. So when I talk about drug-free, I like to point out that there's that line in the sand. And above that line are drugs that are powerful, but potentially very toxic. So those would be the biologics, those would be steroids. They work well, but they come with a whole host of undesirable side effects like death and infection and cancer. And then below that line in the sand, we have drugs that are less powerful, but often work well. And when combined with nutritional therapy can get you to the finish line. So again, I understand that my patient population is a little bit cherry picked because these are people who are seeking me out because they're specifically interested in getting off these drugs. So that might be a little bit higher than what we would see if we randomly picked 100 people. But conservatively, I would guess that half of the people, at least, and again, at 79% in my practice, who are on these drugs can get off them using nutritional therapy. And I'm... Um the majority of the time, is IBD tied exclusively to diet or are there other factors at play here? There are, when we think about autoimmune diseases in general, and we are now up to over a hundred different autoimmune diseases, Chuck, in the US, 50 million Americans, chances are you or somebody you know has one. And what we find is that autoimmune diseases often affect, uh, we one person is often affected by multiple autoimmune diseases. One of my closest friends has diabetes and autoimmune disease. She has psoriasis and autoimmune disease, and she also has psoriatic arthritis. And so that really speaks to the idea that it's a common cause with multiple manifestations. In my patients with inflammatory bowel disease, and again, with IBD, we're talking about two autoimmune diseases, Crohn's disease that can affect any part of the GI tract from the mouth all the way to the anus, and ulcerative colitis that's limited to the colon. So for my patients with IBD, they often have accompanying autoimmune diseases. They often have eczema or alopecia. Sometimes they have lupus. 
other things going on. And again, it speaks to the common etiology. And that common etiology is, yes, there is a genetic component in about 20% of patients, but it seems to be environmental triggers. So even if you're dealt sort of a bad hand and you have a high predisposition for autoimmune disease, like Crohn's, there's some kind of environmental trigger, a, a, literally a switch that's flipped that allows the disease to express itself. And what we see with inflammatory bowel disease is it's damage to the microbiome, specifically some of the specific factors that we can speak to through these population-based studies, frequent use of antibiotics, especially in childhood. So there was a meta-analysis study done out of Mount Sinai where I did my GI fellowship, looking at over 7,000 people. And they found that frequent antibiotics in childhood was one of the top factors for triggering inflammatory bowel disease. And ironically, Chuck, some of the same antibiotics that we've used for decades to treat flare-ups of IBD are some of the ones implicated in the cause. We have similar data from Canada, from Scandinavia, et cetera. So we know that during childhood, when that microbiome, that community of trillions of microbes, primarily in your gut, is really starting to grow and multiply and diversify, that is a time when hitting that with an antibiotic even if you need it, but frequent antibiotics like that can really suppress the development of the microbiome, which affects the immune system. So we see that as a risk factor. The standard American diet is a really enormous one. So the high animal protein, high fat, high sugar processed diet that we eat in America is a major contributing factor. So we have genes, small part. We have diet, huge part. We have medicine cabinet, pretty big part. What else? Well, we know that chronic stress, often a very stressful episode can be the precipitating event. And then there are some environmental triggers, some of which we know about, like a lot of the pesticides pesticides used in the food supply, but there's some we don't know about. There are environmental uh, triggers to IBD that have yet to be identified, but we can see some geographic localization. But by far the biggest factors really are diet, what you're eating, and what's going on in your microbiome. And these are things that are ultimately very controllable. So yes, we do have patients with IBD where literally this disease fell out of the sky, hit them in their lap, nothing they could have done. But we do have instances where we can follow those breadcrumbs backwards from when the disease first prevents itself. And we can point to specific factors, whether dietary, medication, environmental exposures that cause the disease to develop. And the exciting thing there is we can follow those same breadcrumbs back to then try and reverse the disease. So that's the work that I love doing and I'm really excited about. I'm curious if we're looking at this kind of like a pie and it's broken up in terms of percentages here, let's, let's cut this pie up, make a whole food plant-based pie here. Um, you know, what, how big of a slice is going to diet? How big of a slice is going to the environmental factors? How big of a slice is going to stress based off of what it is that you've seen? Well, when we look specifically at IBD, we see different types of IBD, and we definitely see, and this is a minority of people, under 25%, people who have a strong genetic predisposition. And we see this in certain ethnic groups. We see it in people who, have Ash who are of Ashkenazi Jewish descent. And in those people, we'll often see a very strong family history. Grandfather had it, aunts and uncles had it first and second cousins had it, siblings have it. I have a family like that that I take care of where all three of the siblings, two brothers and the daughter, have Crohn's disease. And they've been studied, they've looked at their genetics at NYU, et cetera. So they have a strong genetic predisposition. We can make analogies to cancer, to Alzheimer's, to other chronic diseases. We have people who have two copies of the APOE4 gene for Alzheimer's, a strong family history, and they have a much higher risk. But the majority of people with who have Alzheimer's don't have a genetic form of Alzheimer's. There's environmental contributors. There's head trauma, diet, et cetera, habit, smoking, alcohol. And so we can make similar analogies for inflammatory bowel disease. Yes, we have people who have uh, multiple copies of the NOD2 gene on chromosome 16 and other genetic abnormalities associated with Crohn's. But even in those patients... And we know this from identical twin studies, the concordance, meaning the likelihood that if you have these gene changes, you're going to have IBD is less than 50%. So we know from multiple identical twin studies, a lot of them from Scandinavia, from the UK, that two people with the identical genetic material will not develop 
IBD, less than 50% of the time. So this really speaks to the enormous environmental, dietary influences, et cetera. And again, we're talking about people with a high genetic predisposition. So yes, there is sort of that type of IBD where you're more genetically predisposed, but that's the minority of people. For the majority of people, we know that diet and environmental exposures play a huge role. Those are the major precipitating factors. For example, we see people who have an infectious antecedent event, meaning everybody goes away on spring break maybe, and everybody gets sick, comes down with some kind of traveler's diarrhea, but lo and behold, the patient with IBD six months later is still sick, and then they get diagnosed with IBD. So that pre preceding infectious exposure can be a triggering event. And we see that in about 10 to 15% of people with IBD. I'm seeing a patient now who works for the State Department who had been stationed in Sri Lanka, lots of infectious episodes. And now in his early 60s, he has been diagnosed with severe fulminant ulcerative colitis involving his whole colon. But in his particular case, there likely was an infectious event that happened before. But, uh, you know, even though we can't say exactly what causes these diseases, we know what some of the contributants are. We do know how to make it go away. For in a lot of people. And I'll tell you, Chuck, I'm a conventionally trained gastroenterologist. I trained at Columbia and then Mount Sinai, where Dr. Crohn and his colleagues, Drs. Oppenheimer and Ginsburg, first described Crohn's disease in 1932. And a hundred, almost a hundred years later, 90 years later, uh, 89 to be precise, uh, <laughs> years later, we are a lot closer to understanding what are the contributing factors to this disease. And we know unequivocally the damage to the gut microbiome plays a huge role. And we can therefore understand that rehabbing the microbiome, really understanding what are the factors that disrupt gut microbes and how can we correct those, we can significantly improve the disease. And I always like to point out, I am thrilled that we have incredibly powerful drugs to treat this disease because there's definitely a percentage of patients who need these drugs, refractory to everything else. But what is distressing to me is that my colleagues don't seem to have kept up with the science, understand what's going on in the microbiome, and they're advocating only one way to treat this disease, which is with powerful drugs that have really dangerous side effects. So in my practice, we really build on a platform of nutritional therapy first, and then we add the drugs. It's sort of a step up as right. opposed to a bottom down where you hit this with a, you know, the most potent drug you have and, uh, and you just sort of stop there. <laughs> well, we're going to get into uh, the perhaps kitchen prescription here with the best and worst foods in just a minute. But um, I got to ask you before we get to that, like, what are we noticing in terms of trends in terms of patient volume and prevalence for people with IBD here? We see the obesity rates going up, certain other chronic diseases, the rates going up. What are we seeing with IBD? Yeah, IBD is dramatically increasing like other autoimmune diseases. And, you know, when we talk about the hygiene hypothesis, we see that countries that are more developed in terms of higher levels of sanitation, more antibiotics, more processed food, we see rising rates of inflammatory bowel disease. And I, I'll give you an example of that. I've been on faculty at Georgetown for about 26 years. And a year or two after I came, we had a wonderful GI fellow we were training from Saudi Arabia. And the fellows, the GI fellows in training would rotate through my inflammatory bowel disease clinic. And he said to me, he said, you know, I like you, you're great, you're fun to work with, but I don't really need to come to your clinic because we don't see Crohn's and ulcerative colitis in Saudi Arabia where I'm going back to practice. And about 10 or 12 years after he finished his training, I saw him at a GI conference and he said to me, he said, we now have a clinic devoted exclusively to IBD in Saudi Arabia at the hospital where he was working. So that is pretty typical. We're seeing this dramatic increase, not just in the US, but as countries become more developed. And of course, development comes with many wonderful things. It comes with better access to clean drinking water and, and better sanitation, which can keep disease at bay. But it also comes with other things like ultra processed foods, more antibiotics, et cetera. And so as we're seeing that in parts of the world, like the Middle East, like Sub-Saharan Africa, like Southeast Asia, we're seeing this dramatic increase in autoimmune diseases like inflammatory bowel disease. Mm. I'm, you know, I, I hear you say that, and I wish I could say, Doc, that I was surprised, but uh, honestly, I'm not. 
I'm I'm not at all surprised uh, to hear that. But um, Chuck, Chuck, I just think if I can interrupt you for one second, just yeah. think about autoimmune disease. Think about people in your community, friends, family, et cetera. I mean, I know that your immediate community is a really healthy community. Folks at PCRM are, are super healthy, so they probably have a much lower rate of autoimmune diseases based on the whole foods plant-based diet. But if you think about, if you extend that network, network out a bit, can, you know, it's really hard to come up to find somebody who doesn't have somebody in their family or network who doesn't have autoimmune disease. They are so common. And if I think about, you know, when I was in medical school, I finished medical school 32 years ago. Is that right? Yes, 32 years ago. When I was in medical school, if I was out and about and people asked me what I did and I said gastroenterology and I started, or not a gastroenterologist yet, but if I started talking about Crohn's and ulcerative colitis out at a party, the chances would be very low that anybody I was talking to knew about those diseases, much less had them. Now it is rare that somebody doesn't know what Crohn's or ulcerative colitis is, either because they have it or somebody they know has it. So these diseases are becoming commonplace. And that, mm. you know, that's not good. Like we have to accept that this is not normal for people to have all these multiple autoimmune diseases, Crohn's, ulcerative colitis, rheumatoid arthritis, MS, lupus, not normal. Yeah. And so these diseases are becoming sort of part of the status quo. And just like, as you mentioned, having obesity, it is the majority of our population is overweight or has obesity. And we're normalizing that. And while I'm all for body positivity and loving yourself and embracing yourself, we have to realize that these are medical conditions. And these are medical conditions that indicate that something is terribly wrong and primarily something is terribly wrong in our GI tract. Yeah. You know, and, and that's, that's a conversation for another podcast, but I love talking about that. And it's, it's such a delicate balance between, you know, body positivity and then, you yeah. know, not shielding ourselves from the truth about things either. Um, but let's go ahead really quickly and talk best foods, worst foods here for IBD. Annette, by the way, at 1221 said she's going to share this with her son who unfortunately has ulcerative colitis. So we're definitely doing some good here today. Um, let's start with kind of the worst foods. And I think back, Dr. Chuck, into when I was still overweight, anytime I would eat pizza, I would just double over in pain and have a lot of the nasty symptoms that we were talking about at the top of the show. Um, is pizza among the worst? And what else would you put on that list? What I want to direct people to is Chuck's web, Chuck's website. And I want people to look at under his story, what he ate before when he was, was it 420 was your max? It was, Chuck? yeah, 420. When he Absolutely. weighed 420 pounds and he was eating 10,000 calories a day. I want you to take a look at that list of what he was eating. Then I want you to look at two things lower down on that list. What he was eating after the weight loss, take a quick glance, but then look at the third thing, which is what he was eating when he went vegan. And that pretty much is a primer chuck. Uh, so thank you for providing that without even realizing you were providing it <laughs> of what you ate before. So highly processed food, a lot of fast food, a lot of Taco Bell, a lot of burgers, a lot of pizza, soda, Gatorade, and then what you were eating after the weight loss and after you went plant-based, which is black beans, quinoa, lots of vegetables. And I want to point out, it's not any one food. People often say, oh, well, I just need to go gluten-free or I just need to go dairy-free. It's the sum total of what you're eating. It is a fact that having too much animal protein on your plate doesn't leave enough room for the plant foods and the ultra processed food. So let's talk about why fiber is so important for, with inflammatory bowel disease. When we eat indigestible plant fiber, and we say it's indigestible because those highly fibrous foods are not broken down completely in the upper GI tract. So they travel down to the colon where they're then fermented by bacteria in our colon to produce something called short chain fatty acids. So short chain fatty acids are what we call postbiotics. Prebiotics are the food that the bacteria eat, ideally lots of fiber. Probiotics are the bacteria themselves. And then postbiotics are the metabolites that they make. So short chain fatty acids are incredibly important in the gut for two reasons. Number one, they maintain the health of the gut lining itself. 
They keep that lining intact, which is really important. And one of the defects we see in inflammatory bowel disease is a gut lining that's more permeable. Number one. Number two, and this is probably even more important, they help to control the immune response. Those short chain fatty acids modulate the immune response to make sure that your immune system isn't overreacting, which is exactly what's happening with an autoimmune disease. And at the same time, they make sure it's reactive enough so that you can clear an infection, et cetera. So if you are not eating enough plant fiber, you're screwed. You are screwed. You're not going to have a healthy gut lining. You're not going to have a healthy immune response. And Chuck, the, the really incredible thing is we see this not just with autoimmune diseases. We see it with response to viral infections also. I was so thrilled to see that you had my last book, The Antiviral Gut, behind you on the bookshelf, along with some of my other faves like Will B's book, Fiber Fueled. But what I talked about a lot in that book is the data that the health of your microbiome is actually the most important predictor of outcome after viral illness because it informs your immune, your immune response. So in order to have that Goldilocks immune response where you're not overreacting to normal stimuli, like that's what an autoimmune disease is, it means your body's overreacting to its normal tissue. In the case of Crohn's and ulcerative colitis, it's overreacting to the bacteria in the gut, to your gut lining, et cetera. So in order to prevent that overreaction, and in order to have an immune system that's active enough to clear a viral infection, you need to be eating lots of plant fiber. And we have that, you know, you guys at PCRM have so many studies looking at this. We have data from Dr. Paolo Leonetti, an Italian pediatric gastroenterologist, his landmark study in 2010, where he compared kids in Florence, Italy, eating a highly processed, high meat, high sugar diet with kids in Burkina Faso eating a plant-based diet. I think they ate an occasional termite during the rainy season. And what they found that in toddlers, they were seeing these vast differences in the gut microbiome that were predictive of disease. So even as toddlers, where both groups of kids were healthy, the kids eating lots of plant fiber in Burkina Faso and also exposed to a lot of dirt, had a microbiome that was predictive of leanness and of health. And the kids in Florence eating the high animal fat, high sugar, high processed diet had a microbiome that was predictive of diarrheal diseases like inflammatory bowel disease, obesity, et cetera. So the groundwork for this stuff is laid down really, really early. And particularly for people dealing with kids who have inflammatory bowel disease like Annette, I know how challenging it is to get your kids to eat right. But really understanding that this isn't a matter of, you know, it's better to eat this way versus not. This is a matter of how can we prevent and heal disease. This is actually essential, life-saving, life-changing information to really understand the connection between how we eat and disease in our bodies. And unfortunately, it's a connection that's really broken in our modern medical system. That is the vast majority of my patients with IBD will tell me that when they were seeing their previous gastroenterologist, nobody ever asked them what they ate. And they tell them, it doesn't matter what you eat. You just need to take this drug. Diet is unimportant. And really nothing could be further from the truth. What about somebody who's eating a flexitarian diet, right? So a lot more plants than maybe the standard American diet, but they definitely give themselves prime flexibility. Maybe once or twice a week, they'll eat uh, a steak or a hamburger, or maybe they're pescatarian and they're keeping fish in there or they're lacto ovo, but still uh, what by and large, many would say is a step in the right direction or a step past that standard American diet toward a little bit uh, more healthy. What about those individuals? Are they still at higher risk for developing IBD? Those individuals often do great. And I'm so glad you mentioned that. And I want to say that the work that you do with the podcast, the work that Physicians Committee for Responsible Medicine does, I, I hold Dr. Neil Barnard in the highest regard because not only is the information he's providing so important, but he's doing it for the right reasons. He is in this to make America healthier, the world actually. And so I really respect the information he puts out. I will say that as a gastroenterologist who treats autoimmune disease, there is room on the plate for the kind of diet you're describing. My patients who are flexitarian, pescatarian often do really well. I'm very careful to recommend to them that they limit their animal protein to not more than one meal a day. So if you're having eggs in the morning, that's it for the day. There's no steak for dinner. Uh, because what we find, and of course, this varies greatly from individual to individual, 
But what we find is there's a threshold amount of animal protein where you're crowding out the vegetables and you and not just the vegetables, the plants. So the whole grains, the legumes, the fruits, the vegetables, the nuts, the seeds, the herbs, the spices, etc. There's a threshold there. So we do ask people in our drug-free IBD diet to pay attention to how much animal protein they're eating to make sure it's from the best quality source that they have access to and can afford and to really crowd that out with as many of these plant foods as possible. But we have patients going into complete remission on a flexitarian diet and, uh, you know, who are omnivores or pescatarians. And we have vegans who eat really poorly, who are eating, you know, 80% of their calories are ultra processed foods. So we like to really focus less on the label and more on the food. And Chuck, I know we've discussed a study before and many others on the podcast have, but it's such an important study. It's worth mentioning again. And that's the American Gut Project study from 2018 that said that the number of different plant foods you eat per week is the most important predictor of the health of your microbiome. And that magic number was 30, 30 or more different plant foods per week. So that's again, fruits, vegetables, legumes, it's beans, nuts, seeds, herbs, spices, et cetera. What we find in our IBD population is we focus a lot on beans and greens as being these sort of nutritional powerhouses, but the diversity of plants is really important too. I want to go back to what it was that you said there. You were talking about ultra processed vegan food and you seeing a lot of patients who don't necessarily do quite so well with the, you know, those types of frozen pre-prepared meals that that kind of surprises me. Is is that by and large because there's just more oil, there's more fat, there's more salt? What's it's, going on there? It's the chemicals in them. It's what we call the bioengineered ingredients and the emulsifiers. There was a paper about two years ago, a study that came out showing a clear link between emulsifiers and food and flare-ups of Crohn's disease. And there've been other studies looking at causes of Crohn's disease. Again, when I say cause that trigger, right? In somebody who is susceptible because maybe they have a genetic predisposition, maybe they've eaten a crummy diet most of their life. Maybe they've been on lots of antibiotics and then along comes a diet full of emulsifiers. So things like the soy lecithin, the guar gum, the carrageenan, et cetera, these are not food ingredients. These are bioengineered ingredients that maybe were derived from food the way you can make a car tire from corn, but a car tire is not food. I think we can all agree on that. So same thing. And when you look at the ingredients in these foods and they're, you know, the supermarkets are full of them and they're shortcut foods and they're convenient foods, but the problem is they're not really food. They are edible food like substances and they're ruinous to our gut. And they're especially ruinous to the gut if you have inflammatory bowel disease. So really, Chuck, we know two ways to treat this set of diseases. There's drugs and there's food. And there's not really a third way. And I had a difficult conversation with a patient recently who's been a patient for a while. I hadn't seen her for a few years. And she is very averse to taking medication, which I totally get. And, you know, I'm a champion for. But she literally does not cook. She eats 100% of her food out. And while some of it is from pretty good places, some of it is not. It's convenient food. And I finally said to her, I was like, look, I, these are the only two ways I can treat this disease and often a combination, right, of both. But there's not a third option where you eat, you know, not great food and you don't take drugs and miraculously your IBD just goes away. So... Those are, you know, those are the things that we have in our toolbox at the moment. And even when we look at things like uh, stem cell transplant for inflammatory bowel disease, which is something that's not mainstream, but there's some promising data, we know that because of the constantly changing microbiome, if you don't pay attention to what you're eating, that ultimately is not going to work. If we look at fecal microbiota transplant, a poo transplant which we have some studies showing efficacy for, especially for ulcerative colitis, we know again that if you don't pay attention to what you're feeding those microbes, you're going to revert back to that old microbiome and you're not going to be able to stay in remission. So at the end of the day, food matters and it matters greatly. And, you know, from patient to patient, you could get away with, I mean, I live in the real world, people are going to eat ultra processed foods, but you have to really pay attention to what percentage of the diet and I really work closely with my patients on this. And one of the things I find, Chuck, when you were eating to not have 20 bloody bowel movements a day, 
it's a very different undertaking from, you know, you're eating to fit in your skinny jeans. And interestingly, when my patients get into remission, and we usually start out, we hit it pretty hard with a diet, right? I really kind of have some boundaries about what they, I want them to eat for the first month or two, because I want them to see results. Because results, as you know, are motivating. And then once they are feeling better, I'll say, okay, let's loosen up the reins a little bit. Let's widen these boundaries and add some things in. So I'll ask them, okay, what are you missing? And so many of my patients with Crohn's and ulcerative colitis will say, no, I'm good. I don't need to add anything in I feel, because they've been sick for so long and now they feel well. And that is, you know, that's the best drug of all. I, I'm sure you had a similar experience when you, you know, you lost weight, but then when you went completely vegan and you felt so good, like, I, I don't know, there's nothing out there that could convince you to go back to eating the way you were eating because you feel it in your body. How good you feel. Yeah, it's funny. I was having a conversation with a guy just yesterday. I uh, ducked into uh, one of the the few plant based, uh, well, one of the few restaurants down where my wife and I are in this little country town um, where we can still get a healthy plant based option. And I was just ordering steamed vegetables and rice, and you know, really working with them to make sure that uh, the food was just the way that I needed it. And there's a guy sitting at the bar. Right. And this is the last place I would expect to have this question come to me. He like looks up from his own lunch and he's like, you're vegan, aren't you? And I was like, yeah. He's like, I tried that for a little bit and uh, I really like the way that I felt, but I just, you know, found it really hard to stick with. And uh, I was like, yeah, you know, it's funny. Like, I just can't see myself ever going back because of the way that I feel. And I asked him, I was like, well, how long did you stick with it? He's like, I only lasted a few weeks. And I was like, man. You have to find a way to make it work for you and, you know, spend a little bit of time, even if it's like just a day per week in the kitchen where you're pre-preparing all of your meals and you got everything good to go. If that's what works for you, then that's the way that you do it. And you just get into the routine and suddenly it's not this daunting task anymore. You just figure out how to do it and what works for you. And he really liked that idea because he was struggling, like trying to fix these elaborate gourmet dinners, you know, every single night. and really who's got 90 minutes a day to spend in the kitchen over a hot stove. Not a lot of us. We're all working folk. So maybe he did. He was at a bar in the middle of the day. I don't know, but you know what, whatever, you know what I mean? Yeah. But you, you do, you just feel better. Chuck, there's so much in what you said that is, is so critical that I want to go over. The first thing is that it's hard. I am, you know, if somebody's looking for a hack for their IBD or their gut health, I'm the wrong person. There's no <laughs> hack. It's hard. Like most things in life that are worth having and worth doing, it's hard. There's effort. And for me, I'm often not doing something I should be doing because I'm making soup or I'm making, I mean, I barely made it in time for this because I was like, I got to have my green smoothie and make sure that I big up the green smoothie on Chuck's podcast. But I mean, a green smoothie in reality is, is pretty quick to make, but the most important, I mean, Unequivocally now, in America, it is clear that diet is a main reason we are dying prematurely and we have chronic disease. What we eat every day. So ostensibly, if one of your goals is to live long and to live a healthy life, then what you eat every day is absolutely the most important decision. It's more important than the doctor, the medication, etc. That is the most important decision. Now, I'm not saying don't go to the doctor, don't take medication but understand the importance. So what is more important than that? We have to prioritize. We have to miss out on things sometimes. We have to have things undone because we are spending time paying attention to that. Mm. And that is just the truth. I loved, I think my friend, Joel Kahn, who I know you know, who's a vegan cardiologist. I think it was on Rich Roll's podcast recently. I listened to, I just saw a clip on social media and the clip said that sometimes we have to not eat if there's no good choice available. And, you know, if you say that in America, people are like, oh, well, you're promoting eating disorders. Absolutely not. We're just saying if you are out someplace and there is nothing good to eat, it's okay to be hungry and to wait. It's mm. okay to do that. Most of us have enough extra weight on us. We have enough glycogen stores in our liver that we can miss a meal without something terrible happening. Now, if you're diabetic, if you're pregnant, if you're malnourished, that's a whole different story. But for the majority of us in America, you go someplace, there's nothing good to eat. 
just wait. Wait till you mm. get home. Perfectly okay. And, and understanding that, you know, when you understand how important the food is, and again, we're talking specifically here for patients with inflammatory bowel disease who have chronic autoimmune diseases that can be debilitating and painful, carrying food with you, making sure that, you know, you're going on a road trip, you pack up some food or you're flying or whatever it is, you plan things out. I'm constantly looking at menus to see what's available. What am I going to be able to eat? What looks good? But it takes some time. It's, it's hard. It's not like you just turn up and you eat whatever's there and somehow you're fine. And so I think we really need to emphasize that to people. The other thing I loved about what you said, and you said this earlier, is you don't go from eating a bunch of processed animal protein to gourmet vegan food overnight. And for a lot of people, I think just starting with, okay, I want to get from omnivore, not so great diet to vegan, really healthy diet. How do I do that? One way to do that is to say, I'm going to limit my animal protein. So I'm going to eat one animal meal a day and I'm going to eat one plant meal a day for sure. I'm going to get those two things in. The plant meal could be a smoothie. It could be a soup. It could be a salad. It could be something fancier, but you're going to commit to that. And then you grow from there. And so you could say, okay, I'm doing a salad at lunch every day. This is good. Now I want a vegetarian meal. That's more a hot meal. What can I do? It can literally be, you know, some lentils and rice. It doesn't have to be super fancy, but making that commitment, you know, it's like an extension of meatless Monday, making that commitment to nourishing yourself in this particular way on a daily basis or five days a week or whatever works for you. And then growing from there. And, you know, it is, it is pretty rare that somebody does that and they don't start to feel the difference and they feel it pretty quickly. Uh, yeah. Matter of fact, we have, uh, speaking of feeling it pretty quickly, America, let's get healthy 1217. Uh, I feel like we covered the first part of this question, wondering whether someone uh, could still develop all of these conditions, eating a processed vegan diet. But then they were also wondering, you know, how quickly a patient might expect to begin seeing results. Is it, possible to quantify that? Like, is there sure. an average here? Yeah. So in terms of like coming back to inflammatory bowel disease, Crohn's disease and ulcerative colitis, and again, reminding people, these are complex autoimmune diseases. We did a study, we presented the data back in 2014. So a little less than 10 years ago, we presented it at one of our international GI conferences called Digestive Disease Week. And we did a retrospective analysis of 14 patients, nine with ulcerative colitis, three with Crohn's, these were patients who had pretty significant disease. A lot of the Crohn's patients had had surgery, they'd had parts of their bowel resected, they were on immune suppressing drugs. We found that the average time to significant improvement was about 60 days. But there were patients who noticed a difference as quickly as two days. There were others who take a, took a few weeks, but it was typically around two months to, but two months to really feel like, okay, their disease is really under control. It was 30 days for patients to notice an improvement. So, you know, when we approach this in the practice, I usually tell people, give me 90 days, give me three months, let's hit it hard. And then once you're feeling better, we can start to loosen things up a little bit. And again, patients, I had a patient who messaged me on the portal the other day, it made me so happy to say she had been to a tertiary care medical center. I won't name names. And they told her she had to be on a biologic. They told her not to get pregnant, all of this. And she started doing the green smoothies and made some other changes to her diet. And she's pregnant. She is having zero symptoms, no bleeding, no urgency, et cetera. And that happened after about three weeks. So it varies a lot from person to person, but, um, you know, generally within 30 days, you're going to see improvements and we can see remission as quickly as 60 days. Man, that's fantastic. Um, and just housekeeping note for those who are wondering, when you say uh, was put on a bio uh, bio biologic, bi that's the word <laughs> I'm looking for. Are we talking about antibiotic there? No, biologics are the immune suppressing drugs that you see advertised all over TV, Humira, Stellara, Remicade, all of those drugs that start, and it's been a couple of decades now that started out primarily for sicker patients with IBD. And now we see they're using them for eczema, for asthma, for all kinds of things. These drugs, the Humira, which is one of the big ones we use for IBD and other autoimmune diseases, we're talking about trillions of dollars for these are mm. blockbuster drugs. And again, they work but they come at a cost because if we think about, you know, immunology 101, how the immune system works, Goldilocks immune system, just right. 
overactive immune system, autoimmune disease, you're reacting to your body's own tissue, or severe allergic reactions, food allergies, severe allergies to bees, wasps, etc. Your immune system is too reactive. But the flip side of that is an immune system that isn't reactive enough. And what happens there? Serious infection, you get COVID, you can't clear the virus, you end up with acute respiratory distress syndrome and maybe even die because your immune system can't mount an active enough response to fight the virus or cancer because our immune system doesn't just fight infection. It also does surveillance to look at cells that are abnormally dividing and get rid of them and say, these cells are abnormally dividing. This is heading in the wrong direction. So when your immune surveillance is suppressed, it means cancer is going to develop. And that's why the two main side effects of these biologics are serious infection, not just viral, but bacterial, fungal, parasitic, et cetera, and cancer. Mm. And so, yeah, the drugs work, but at a price. And we're talking about diseases that affect a lot of young people. 80 to 90% of people with Crohn's are diagnosed before they're 30 years old. So you're looking at, you know, a teenager potentially being on this drug for decades. So it's a cumulative risk of complications. And again, I just want to point out, I myself have patients on biologics. I prescribe them. But after we have exhausted the diet and lifestyle modality, so it's not just diet, it's stress, it's sleep, it's movement, it's exposure to nature. You got to get out there and get exposed to soil microbes. It's all of it. And if I can make a little plug for our drug-free IBD program, we've, a huge part of the program is diet, but we focus on these other things too. Mindfulness, movement, stress, sleep, all of these things are incredibly important. Yeah. And you can sign up for that program right now at gutbliss.com. There's a link in the show description and in the episode notes, go ahead and click that. It's uh, right down below. Um, want to open up the doctor's mailbag here. You've been really generous with your time for uh, hanging around. want to get to a couple of questions, but uh, first I want to give a shout out to a couple of success stories. Uh, number one, Valley Green Cindy says, uh, hi from Virginia's beautiful Piedmont region. It is gorgeous out there. Uh, turned to 100% plant-based five months ago. I'm I'm off my blood pressure medication. I've lost 17 pounds and counting says they are feeling great. I love to hear that. Um, also want to say hi to Janie and Annette who's listening today. Sonia, I became vegan eight months ago. Just put this in at 1245. Became vegan eight months ago. Lost 40 pounds off three medications and my cholesterol and inflammatory markers are now normal. How cool is that? I love hearing that, right? And it's still, it, it blows my mind that there are doctors on here. And as you said, you know, not anti-med, but medication doesn't necessarily need to be the first line of defense. It's a stepping process, right? Let's try these other things before we get there. And as you said, in 80% of cases, like you can get remission um, in, in another route. So it's refreshing to me, doc, to have somebody here uh, who talks about treating the cause instead of just the symptoms. You know, it, it seems like such an obvious thing to do, um, but it hasn't been the thing that we've been doing for so long. And, you know, it's, you know. Um, you know, Chuck, it's worth just spending a minute on that because yeah. again, I'm a conventionally trained doc, uh, Columbia, Mount Sinai. I've been on the faculty at Georgetown since 1997. And I, I often ponder now that I've had my aha moment and my awakening. And as you know, I this is what I do in my practice. I write books about this, et cetera. But knowing my colleagues as well as they do, I know my GI colleagues at Georgetown, for example, to be incredibly well-meaning people. These are wonderful people. They are very interested in their patient's health. They are not people who see the patient as an ATM machine, let's just get our money and move on. But what they are is uninformed because all of us in medical school, we are indoctrinated. We're not just taught, we're indoctrinated. A pill for every ill. Don't worry about why this person is sick. Worry about what they have and what you're going to use to treat it. And that is still 32 years after I graduated from medical school. That is still very much the focus. So you have people who have gone through, you know, my medical training was four years of medical school, one year of internship, two years of residency, a year as chief resident, two years of gastroenterology, 10 years of indoctrination, really, saying this is how you treat disease. And so physicians are much more biased in favor of a pharmaceutical therapy 
than the average layperson. Because if I went out there and I asked a 10 year old with no medical background, Hey, do you think what you eat affects what's going on in your gut? They would say, of course it does. Duh. Common sense. (laughs) Right. But you ask a physician, a highly trained gastroenterologist with 10 years of training, and they'll tell you, no, it doesn't matter. So what it is, is that we have been biased and indoctrinated. And I consider myself to have had the best medical training available out there, period. And I was one of those physicians, you know, 15 years ago, who when a patient came in telling me, the rare patient who came in, sharing with me like what they did to get their Crohn's under control. If it involved food, I was rolling my eyes and thinking, "Mm -hmm." I was that doctor. So what I want to tell people is be patient with your doctor. And if you feel like this doctor is well-meaning, but maybe poorly informed, have a dialogue, inform them, take them some studies, talk about what's working for you. Because that's what my generous patients did with me. And my eyes were open one patient at a time. I mean, I couldn't argue with it. When I would, patient would tell me, and I I talk about this in the books, you know, my first patient with Crohn's, wonderful woman who left the DC area, came back eating very differently. She came back to see me. I asked her, what are you taking? And she's like, nothing. And I literally started to get palpitations. (laughs) And she said, I feel fine. And I'm thinking, okay, you don't really feel as fine as you think you do. And then I scoped her and it was gone. Her Crohn's, her deep ulcers healed, normal looking colon. And I thought that was magic back then. I just did not understand it. We're talking about, you know, 20 years ago, did not understand it. And I've seen it so many times since then. And now I can induce it. I can help patients get there. But I was a skeptic. And so if you are a doctor who all you do is prescribe these drugs, that's all you know. And somebody coming along and saying, oh, no, you can treat this with food, it sounds crazy. And that's why I I feel such a duty as a conventionally trained gastroenterologist who's chaired the GI societies and written textbooks and, you know, very much part of the conventional crowd to say to my colleagues, you know, it's great that we have these drugs. They can work really well in refractory cases, but there is another way. And I'm really proud to say, Chuck, that most of my referrals come from other gastroenterologists. The patient will come in and they'll say, okay, well, you know, your disease is pretty active. I think you should be on a biologic. And the patient will say, well, I'm, you know, I read the side effects. I'm not so keen. Is there anything else? And they'll say, well, there's this doctor in town, Dr. Chatkan. She does a lot of nutritional therapy. You should probably go see her. So the vast majority of my referrals come from my GI colleagues. And that's, that's really important to me because it validates that even though that may not be a philosophy they share, that may not be an expertise they have, they recognize what's possible, right? And so I always tell people like, unless your gastroenterologist is just an asshole, in which case fire them and get, you know, if they're just obnoxious, then by all means, find a new doctor. But if they're just uninformed and they're like, oh, I don't know if that stuff works. I don't have any experience with that. Then, you know, hang in there with them, hang in there with them. And that, because that is how we really change the medical system from within. When you adopt a plant-based diet and your symptoms get better and you go back and see your gastroenterologist and you tell them you're better and they don't really believe you, but then they scope you and they see how good it is, then they start to understand and they start to believe. And then the next patient who comes along, they'll say, well, you know, I don't have much experience, but my patient's doing this diet and blah, blah. And that's how we change it. Damn, that is some straight shooting there, doc. That is, that is some straight shooting. Oh my goodness. I uh, got one more thing I need to ask you about before we wrap things up today. Um, but I also want to share a couple more quick success stories. Dave uh, says one year on a whole food plant-based diet, lost around 45 to 50 pounds and feeling great. Our buddy Rich, 1247, 72, you get this, 72-year-old bodybuilder. Says, luckily, was lifting every day, started my vegan whole food plant-based diet, felt great. Recovery was outstanding. This is something that 
normal people can't feel. Um, Ali, checking in from Scotland, that global impact. Just listening to you and your guests helps me tweak small and make more healthy changes to my diet every week. I'm now fully whole food plant-based and now trying to make choices even healthier. We'll keep up the great work, Ali. We are pulling for you. And Lori is talking about all of the fantastic vegan food options that are in stores and restaurants in New York City. She says her daughter in Manhattan is keeping her up to date. And by the way, Lori, um, on July 12th, uh, we're doing the big exam room live in New York. Dr. Neil Barnard's going to be with me. Dr. Robert Osfeld, Dr. Michelle McMacken uh, will also be there. We're all getting together for what I'm calling the most heart healthy night of your life. And Rip Esselstyn from Plant Strong will also be in the house. So July 12th, Lori, I hope that you and your daughter can join us. It's going to be at the City of the Museum of New York. And tickets, you can get yours right now, pcrm.org slash events. And I know for a fact that there's a link to that also in the episode notes. So I'll be talking more about that as the day nears. Um, but And every single one of those docs you mentioned, Michelle, and I know Rip isn't a physician, but um, are the real deal. I mean, again, these people are so vested in spreading the word and making people healthy. And, you know, when you see the whole Esselstyn clan, you know, Rip and Jane and Anne and, and Essie, like you just want some of what they're having. You're like, yeah. okay, these people are so full of health and vitality and you see what they're eating. Right. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's incredible. I love, I love, love me some Rip Esselstyn and Jane and Anne and Essie. I mean, the whole clan is just fantastic. I love those guys. So it's going to be really great to catch up with Rip. So join us on the 12th. It's going to be a fantastic night. I promise you. And the hors d'oeuvres, I'm told that everybody's going to be able to sample off the charts. Good off the charts. Good. I'm just going to leave that right there for you. Uh, but doc, speaking of New York, I got to end with this. And every year on the 4th of July is the big Nathan's hot dog eating contest. I mean, we're talking about hundreds of thousands, if not millions of people watching this around the world. And it's about 10 competitors who really love to eat them some hot dogs. The record in 10 minutes was set by a guy by the name of Joey Chestnut, ate 76 hot dogs in 10 minutes. And I'm just curious, as a gastroenterologist, if you could tell us what kind of holy hell they're putting their digestive tract through when they gorge on that amount of hot dogs, like what is going on inside? I was listening to an NPR program yesterday about hot dogs. And they mentioned that in the US, we eat over, I think it's over 3 billion hot dogs a year, but 150 million of them or eaten on July 4th. And hot dogs are just all the ground up animal parts, whether it's a pork or a beef. So it's literally like, you know, pig penis and hoof and all mm. the kind of wasted cuts, like not the prime pork shoulder, whatever, right? It's all those leftover bits ground up. They've got chemicals in them, sulfates, nitrates, all kinds of emulsifiers and fillers. So I cannot think of something worse to put in my body other than maybe soda, soda and hot dogs. That combination, if you really want to do something terrible to your GI tract. And so you're looking at really kind of scrap food, scrap processed food, and then enormous amounts of it at one time. So a terrible idea. I mean, for those of you out there who have this association that a hot dog is an incredibly patriotic thing and you want to eat it once a year on July 4th, that's one thing. But to be eating dozens of hot dogs at a time, cannot think of a worse thing for your GI tract. Like what, like what, what actually though is happening? I mean, obviously the stomach's got to swell and expand to uh, accommodate that volume, but like what type of levels of inflammation are we talking yeah. about? So, and I would imagine that that's going to stick around for more than a day, right? I mean, absolutely. That's really so first of all, it. let's talk about the stomach size. Your stomach when it's not full is about this big full is about the size of a, a fist like this. So this is a lot more than 76 hot dogs. Okay, can hold in my fist at a time. So you're going to induce some stretching of the stomach. You're going to induce some reflux. And because hot dogs have a high fat content, 
food with a high fat content, typically animal protein, animal fat, slows down the emptying of the stomach. It sends a message to a little bundle of nerves called the gastric pacemaker that determine how quickly our stomach empties and slows it down. So you're inducing something called gastroparesis, uh, which is a, you know, a pathologic condition of slow stomach emptying. Then let's talk about what it's doing to the microbiome. We know from a study that was published in the journal Nature several years ago that the changes in the microbiome are evident about 30 hours after food hitting the gut. So if you switch, for example, from a high animal protein, high animal fat diet to a plant-based vegan diet, within about 30 hours, you start to see levels of the microbes associated with inflammation dropping. You start to see the levels of the good Fecalobacterium prosnitzii, the ones that produce a short chain fatty acids increasing. And those changes affect our genes. So when the microbiome changes, it turns different genes on and off. And so, yes, you can actually be creating more lasting damage with doing that kind of gorging. And remember, nobody just shows up for the Nathan's hot dog eating contest cold. They've been practicing. And what have they been doing to practice? They've been eating lots of hot dogs. So These this is like, facts. to me, it makes me think of like gladiator and people, you know, the gladiators <laughs> fighting to the death, right? Like eating hot dogs to the death. Please don't do this. Yeah, right. I'm just curious, though, what would happen? There's a great recipe for carrot dogs on uh, PCRM's website, PCRM.org. Just click on recipes and, and search carrot dogs. And uh, even the old me, the big 420 pound me, would have been skeptical as anything about trying the carrot dog, but I would have enjoyed it. And so I'm just curious, like what the difference would be in terms of the body's response and the inflammatory response eating 76 carrot dogs, not recommending that versus the 76 hot dogs, which you notably pointed out includes pig penis. Yeah. So 76 carrot dogs is a bad idea to volume wise, but <laughs> a lot of carrot dogs, dramatic difference. We're talking about the inflammatory markers are really a sign, a lot of it, of what's going on chemically in the body, what's going on microbially. And again, 30 hours. In this study I talked about, they took the same nine volunteers and they took them from a pork rinds prosciutto diet with cheese to a jasmine rice lentil diet. So, you know, equiv equivalent to, I think, the carrot, uh, the carrot dog. And, and they saw these dramatic changes. They saw the bilophilia, the bile-loving bacteria that are important for breaking down meat products. They saw those drop. Now, they break down meat products, but they also induce inflammation. So they saw the levels of bilophilia dropping rapidly, the healthy microbes going up. So it's not just, oh, I feel better. They're actually chemical and microbial changes in the body as a result of eating these different foods. I mean, food is information for our body. Absolutely. No question about it. I'm actually going to pull up the link right now for uh, the carrot dog recipe. I'm going to drop it in the chat for everybody just because uh, I know that there's a lot of people who are wondering about that. Boom. There you go, everybody. Enjoy that. Um, so I guess my final question to you is this. We've learned a lot today, not just about hot dogs and now carrot dogs, uh, but certainly about IBD, which was the topic at hand and your drug-free IBD course. People can sign up for that at gutbliss.com. What other courses are you offering right now? So we have a course called Getting Regular for Constipation. And the Getting Regular course is evergreen. You can do it anytime. And so is a drug-free IBD course. But the drug-free IBD course also includes six live calls with me, 90 minutes each. So what is that? Nine hours of, uh, of time. Three of the calls are live Q&A, 90 minutes. You send in your questions ahead of time. We already have a bunch from people who signed up. The course opened about a week ago. We already have a lot of people who signed up. So during the Q&A which is once a month, you get to send in any question you have about inflammatory bowel disease, and we, we, I answer it in a live Zoom. The other three live calls are master classes where I present some interesting topic. The first one we're doing is, is inflammatory bowel disease curable? We have other master classes on what are the food ingredients to avoid, et cetera. And that master class is me talking for about half the time, 45 minutes and sort of grand round style, giving a lecture. And then the other 45 minutes is questions. So one of the things with these courses, I mean, I wish I could see everybody in my office. That's not really feasible. So I want to figure out how can we scale what we do in a way that's more accessible, more affordable 
affordable for people, but where the courses are, we have a learning management system and there are ebook modules and there's audio from me and video from me, but we still really want to make sure people have some live time to ask their questions, to really make sure that um, their, their questions are being answered and they're getting that one-on-one -on -one time. So it's a little bit of a mix of the modules, ebooks, plus um, the live calls. And I'll tell you, Chuck, Nothing gives me more satisfaction in my professional life than getting people with Crohn's and ulcerative colitis off of biologics. I mean, it is literally this. I mean, I get tingly just thinking about it, not because, again, the drugs are bad, but because the drugs have such problematic side effects. And we're talking a lot of the time about young people. And also when people understand that, like, wow, I have control over my disease in this way that they never thought they had. Like I can do things to help my disease get better. I mean, it's a kind of empowerment that you, you don't often get as a physician. And I always tell people, my goal is you don't need to see me. You're good. Like do this course or come see me one time. If you're seeing me over and over and over again, I'm not doing my job. Yeah. I haven't given yeah. you the right tools. Yeah. That's why you're the best. That's why you are the best. And you're a good follow on Instagram as well, at Gut Bliss. Uh, Dr. Robin Chutkin, thank you so much for your time. This has just been a treat uh, and so informative. And you are just the best. Cannot oh. wait to have you back. Right back at you, Chuck. And remember, everybody, go to Chuck's website and <laughs> go to the About section. Look at his diet before and look at his diet now. And that's everything you need to know. Plus that's the amazing. green smoothie. Yeah, there you go. The green smoothie. That's the recipe right there. All right, Doc. I appreciate your time. We'll talk soon. Thanks so much. All right. To the crew behind the scenes, thank you guys so very much for helping to make the magic happen. And to you, Exam Roomies, thanks for hanging out and sharing your success stories and asking amazing questions and raising your health IQ with us today. And for everybody at the Physicians Committee, I am the weight loss champion, Chuck Carroll. We'll talk to you again very soon. But until then, keep it plant-based.